If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Let us pray. Merciful God, we know that you love us and that you call us to fullness of life. But around us and within us, we see the brokenness of the world and of our ways. Our successes leave us empty. Our progress does not satisfy. Our prosperous land is not the promised land of our longing. Forgive our willful neglect of your word, our insensitivity to the needs of others, and our failure to accept your gifts that nourish. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Anyone in Christ becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the Gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. I invite you to be seated. A few notes on the service of the Word. It has long been my practice to read all four lessons appointed in the Revised Common Lectionary at every Sunday worship service, even if I'm only preaching out of one of them, which I generally do. I do that because one of the gifts of lectionary is that over its three-year cycle, it allows us to hear about 90% of the New Testament and about 40% of the Old Testament. And there is a place both for those texts that, that uh, we love dearly and that affirm our faith, and for those texts which we find challenging. So the Old Testament text today is... King David being a very bad boy with the neighbor lady. And uh, I, I, I uh, had to speak with some colleagues about whether or not it was a good thing to include this lesson in today's worship service, given what has happened in this community over the last few years. And one of the things my wiser colleagues told me is that it might be good to know that you're not alone when uh, leaders of the community uh, don't behave very well. So we're going to read out of 2 Samuel 11. Uh, if you want to pursue this further, I would encourage you to take your bulletins home, read the lesson again, and then keep reading all the way through the middle of chapter 12 where King David gets his comeuppance in the famous story of the prophet Samuel about the rich neighbor who stole the poor neighbor's land. And one other item, uh, the design on the front of your bulletin <coughs> is uh, a mosaic uh, from the place where it is believed that Jesus uh, preached to the crowd that he fed, uh, where he fed so many people. And you'll notice that there are two fish and only four loaves. And that's because Jesus Christ, the bread of life, is considered the fifth loaf in that story. If I know you're going to print your bulletins in color, I'd have found a color copy for this. But I have something that's perhaps even better to show you. This uh, little piece of ceramic from the Holy Land uh, that will give you a sense of the color and what this looks like, even if those uh, pieces of bread look so small. So if you'd like to pass this around the room, do you like to see this? Pass it around while I'm reading the scripture lessons. A reading from the second book of Samuel, the 11th chapter. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. 
the woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to, and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence, and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch, with the servant to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, Set Uriah at the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. The word of the Lord. The responsive uh, reading can be found on the right side of the inside of your bulletins. It's a setting of the 14th Psalm, again the psalm appointed for today in the Revised Common Lectionary. Let us join our hearts and our voices in reading the poetry of the psalmist responsibly. <coughs> Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. Have they no knowledge of the evildoers? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. from the letter attributed to Paul uh, to the church at Ephesus, the third chapter. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth 
and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John, the sixth chapter. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum, it was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. We turn to the hymnals again for our hymn of preparation at number 207, just as I am. <laughs>
to be seated. Let us pray. Not my word, O God, but your word be preached in this time, in this place, for these, your faithful people. Amen. Two thousand years ago, more or less, a crowd of people who had just listened to Jesus talk about the kingdom of God followed this compelling teacher as he tried to find some time away from his work. The crowd numbered several dozen folks, perhaps a few hundred. They found him in an isolated place, and there they enjoyed an impromptu picnic. Jesus acted as a good Jewish dinner host, giving thanks for all the food that would nourish his guests. There seemed to be so little food for so many people, and yet twelve baskets of leftover pieces of bread lay in front of the crowd before they departed. Something special happened that afternoon on that grassy hill, which became a sweet, cherished memory for many of the people who followed Jesus in some way or another. Plenty of people, even among followers of Jesus, may question whether some events in Jesus' ministry that contradict our ordinary ideas of living actually happen. After 12 trips through the lectionary, I am convinced that a real event lies behind this story of Jesus feeding a multitude of people. The people who enjoyed that picnic treasured this memory and told the tale frequently during the church's living room worship services. The joy on their faces and the confidence in their voices brought new Christians to love this story as much as they did. When it came time to put these stories in writing, members of the Jesus movement insisted that this tale of the picnic on a hill be included. And write it down they did. The four Gospels include six stories of this unplanned picnic. In four of them, one in each gospel, 5,000 people enjoyed themselves and had plenty to eat, and 12 baskets of leftover pieces were gathered. In two of them, 4,000 people savored their unexpected meal and came away well fed, and the picnickers passed by seven baskets of leftovers when they went home. All of these narratives have their beginnings, I believe, in one single picnic on a grassy hill somewhere near the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't the food that made the occasion special. The barley loaves and fish relish were ordinary foods, mostly eaten by poor people in that part of the world. The presence of Jesus, the teacher who had nourished them in so many ways, made the day extraordinary, and the memory of his presence at this picnic on the grass lifted their spirits for the rest of their lives. Allow me to give you a few notes on the details before I go further. The crowds of 4,000 or 5,000 people come from the exaggerations of ancient storytellers as the years passed and the tale moved on from one community of Christians to the next. Even today, it would be impossible to move that many people on foot from one place to another so quickly without a great deal of planning. The barley loaves and two clay jars of fish relish brought by one person, in this case a boy, reflect the excellent preparation of one person or one family to follow Jesus in his travels for several days. Quite a few of the people present probably had some food with them for a journey of perhaps a day of listening to this traveling preacher. The presence of Jesus and the dazzling clarity of his teaching moved them to trust in his purposes as Jesus trusted in God to provide. In all of Palestine, the farmers used methods that would never allow them to grow enough food to feed all the people who lived in that oppressed land. One scholar, examining the farming methods of that day, reports that most of the people who lived there 
did not have enough food to eat by our standards. They didn't have anywhere near that amount of food. The poor, the vast majority of the population of Palestine back then lived with a calorie deficit for their entire lives. Their stomachs were so small and their expectations were so low that it wouldn't take much food to impress them and make them satisfied. In five of the six stories about this unplanned picnic, reports of the vast number of people seemed like they were tacked on to the end of the narrative, almost as an afterthought. Absent those sentences inserted by some narrator along the way, the stories were just as powerful to the ears of the first listeners as they are to you and me today. Only the fourth gospel writer moves the exaggerated number of people in the body, into the body of this version of the story, probably to emphasize the two disciples who misunderstood Jesus' question about feeding the crowd. Even more, only the fourth gospel writer tells us that Jesus, after he had been blessed, after he had blessed the bread, personally served the gathered picnickers the lunch which satisfied so many of their hungers. Only this gospel writer of the four uses this story to move on to Jesus' speech in which he declares, I am the bread of life. The gospel writer, this gospel writer, emphasizes that Jesus fed all who came to him and gave them as much as they wanted. One could easily miss the next few words when they were satisfied. The first note that something wondrous has happened with what appears to be so little food. Jesus insists that the disciples gather up the leftover pieces of bread so that nothing may be lost. What Jesus had to give was sufficient. What Jesus had to give was as much as his followers wanted. What Jesus had to give was more than sufficient. And as an abundance, even an overabundance of bread lay in clear view of all whom Jesus had fed. Jesus gave them bread, the food celebrated as the staff of life, and it nourished them more than they dared to imagine. What Jesus had to give them was sufficient, even more than sufficient. For those who followed Jesus to that faraway hillside, the picnic on that hill remained a cherished memory of their days with Jesus. They didn't remember that day because of the delicious, out-of-the-ordinary food. Any tyrant could put that kind of food before any people he or she chose, rich or poor. They didn't remember the occasion because the after-dinner entertainment was terrific. I've been to a couple of wider church dinners where the food was marvelous and the after-dinner program was a crashing bore. Besides, Jesus didn't make a big fuss or say any magic words when he gathered the food to feed his guests. He offered words of thanks for the food, like any Jew good Jewish dinner host would offer. No one there knew what he had done until the leftovers were collected. Only then did they know what Jesus had done to feed his picnic guests. When Jesus is present, what he has to offer is sufficient, even more than sufficient. His dinner guests esteem bread as the staff of life, but soon we all learn that bread becomes a metaphor for all the life-giving gifts that Jesus is and gives. Out of this wondrous picnic, we all learn what Jesus gives, that what Jesus gives may never be lost and should always be treasured. Out of this sweet memory passed on from the disciples and others who shared in this simple meal, we learn that the gifts he gives and he is are more to be valued than the day-to-day -day prosaic life into which many of us stumble when we don't look at the world with the eyes of faith which let us peek at the kingdom of God entering into our ordinary lives. Most of us have a fondly remembered meal somewhere in our pasts, perform a, which form a treasured memory, even if it's just coffee and a donut with someone special 
on a special day. On the Sunday afternoon that I graduated from seminary in 1985, some friends of mine and I went out for dinner to celebrate. After years as poor students, we went to an ordinary family restaurant. We laughed and celebrated over what we had accomplished, knowing that we were all leaving for faraway places. The food was good, but not great. No tablecloth or creative centerpiece graced our table. But I remember that evening joyfully, even after so many years. If a special dinner of your sweet memory was a very good meal with plenty of food, that's okay. This is not a competition to find out who had the most insignificant food at a tender moment. Still, if that special meal was the Christmas dinner a few months before your beloved grandmother died, I can imagine that the presence of your grandmother at that occasion stands front and center in your memory of that meal, even if the turkey was remarkably moist and your aunt's pumpkin pie was unusually good. When Jesus is present, the resources he has at his disposal are sufficient, even more than sufficient. When Jesus is present, life is more than just full stomachs, as in this story, or full jars of wine, as we read four chapters earlier. When Jesus is present, divine life is made visible in ways that we cannot understand if we keep our distance from him. When Jesus is present, ordinary bread becomes the bread of life, which is never exhausted. When Jesus is present, the kingdom of God can be glimpsed with the eyes of faith, even in ordinary places we would consider far from holy. Emmanuel United Church of Christ is surrounded by the cornfields of rural Sheboygan County, except for the Lakeland University campus half a mile down the road. The church had joined several others in helping to establish the college back in the 19th century and served as its chapel for some years. But the college built its own chapel, hired its own chaplain, and as the years passed, Emmanuel Church became more and more like its neighboring rural congregations. Late in 2019, the church's members learned that the steeple on their 1911 building had a crumbling foundation. It didn't need just simple maintenance. The foundation needed a complete reconstruction, or it would soon become a threat to the entire building because of the danger of its collapse. On a leap of faith, the little church made a commitment to raise the $250,000 needed to repair the signature steeple on their wooden building. Then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. They couldn't gather to worship in their beloved church. They couldn't even gather to celebrate the beginning of the repair work on the steeple as the contractors arrived. People lost their jobs. The congregation began to worry about its future. In the midst of all this anxiety, some of the church's leaders began to realize that they needed to take care of each other and their community. The nearest food pantries were eight to 10 miles away from their rural neighbors. As they bit their fingernails over the future of the church, they took another leap of faith. They opened a drive through food pantry two days a week. Word got around about the food pantry, and soon the little church's uh, ministry was serving about 30 households a week. The church didn't judge any of the people who came for help and did everything it could to be generous to them. They did it by themselves with a little help from the immediate area. They never turned anyone away. When the shelves began to look empty, donations would come in before they opened up on Thursday afternoons. Almost always the donations were exactly what was needed. The volunteers got to know their visitors well, and the conversations that they might have enjoyed at the local coffee shop took place over the trunks of the visitors' cars. On the early visits, the talk centered on the difficulty of getting unemployment benefits. Later on, the visitors and volunteers would celebrate when the visitors got their unemployment claims approved. Still later, 
the visitors would arrive with stories about the new jobs they had just found. A few weeks after that, the visitors would come again with donations of food. The church decided to make the food pantry a long-term ministry of their congregation, and they had partnered with the county social services division and others for donations and referrals. On June 27th, the little congregation gathered for in-person worship and dedicated the steeple once again on a safe, strong foundation to the glory of God. They had good reasons to celebrate. They had already raised enough money to pay for the needed repair work on their steeple. The resources seemed so meager. Whether it was five loaves and two fish, or the financial resources of the small church's members, people asked, what are they among so many people and so much need? On that day so long ago, and earlier this year, only a month ago, at a small church across the state, the followers of Jesus discovered that when Jesus is present, what is there for us is sufficient, even more than sufficient. With the eyes and ears of faith, we can trust that what Jesus gives us is sufficient, even when the resources at hand look so meager in worldly terms. When trusting in his purposes for us, we can even see the baskets of leftover food, whatever form those leftovers take in our lives. When we follow Jesus, we can know down to our toes that he will equip us with anything we need to share his love with all those whom he wants us to love as our neighbors. When Jesus tells us that everything is ready for some form of the picnic on a hill to which he calls us, may we be ready to trust in his purposes and share his love. Amen. Are there people or families for whom we should pray this morning? The prayers this morning were composed by the Reverend Tina Kemp of the Church of Scotland. Let us pray. God of wondrous signs, provider of daily bread, word of life and love, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, the living bread, broken and shared for all. We thank you that even the crumbs of our lives and of our labors are useful to you in the service of your kingdom. We thank you for your endless, overflowing grace that knows no bounds, even as we seek to limit it through our bad choices. Lord God, as you heard the cries of your people in the wilderness and fed them bread from heaven, as we remember how Jesus nourished your people with words of justice and compassion, hear us today as we pray for our world. We pray for those whose daily need for food, clean water, and proper shelter goes unmet. And for those misusing what they have in the vain pursuit of pleasure, feed them with a sense of justice and fairness. They might stand firm in their right to a decent life for all people now. We pray for those whose lives have been broken by violence and crime, conflict and struggle, Feed them with courage and anticipation for a life beyond the barriers which hold them back. We pray for those who are sick or sorrowing, and for those who care for and console them. We pray especially for those we know personally who are facing difficulties at this time in their lives. Fill them, Lord, with your healing presence and remind them of your promises. We pray for those who have lost faith in themselves 
and in you, and who struggle to find meaning in life, focus their eyes on you, Lord, and give them hope for a new day. We pray for ourselves that we might be filled with energy to serve you better in our daily living, and that we might even, in our doubt, be reminded that you will never turn away or abandon us. May we always look to you as the one who gives them, the one who gives us life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to boldly pray these words, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There are plates waiting for your offerings. Uh, by the center doors at either side of them, and I encourage you to be generous with the, uh, the many ministries of this congregation uh, as it prepares for a new, uh, as it prepares for a future with new leadership. Again, the plates wait for you on stands by the center door. Let's pray. Loving God, we bring to you our gifts according to the ways in which we have prospered under your care. Follow these gifts with your blessing, that they would be used to share your love in Jesus Christ with all the world's people. Make us as ready to give to your purposes as we are needy for your mercy. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. When I put together a worship service, I like to uh, include two hymns of the three that will be familiar, if not outright the love, and one that is a little more challenging. And so when I, I sent my bulletin materials early last week about uh, hymn number 46, Hope of the World, uh, I got word back, well, we don't know this one. And so I replied, well, I, I just love this text and I just love the text in tune. And I should have known better, the text is still lovely, but uh, the editors of the New Century Hymnal set it to a different tune. So we're not going to get to sing it to the, uh, the, that lovely uh, uh, Geneva and Psalter tune called Dun Secour. Uh, we're going to sing it to Ancient of Days. Uh, we have rehearsed it a little bit uh, I've gotten uh, familiar enough with the tune, which I've heard in other settings, uh, that I can help guide you through it, and our three musicians are prepared to lead you through it. Uh, this was my mistake. I really should have known better. Uh, we're going to hear the tune in its entirety once, and then we will sing these four stanzas of Hope of the Moon. Would all who are able to stand?
Christ, our only Savior, so dwell with us that we may go forth with the light of hope in our eyes and the fire of inspiration on our lips, your word on our tongues, and your love in our hearts. Amen. Amen.